Thank you, Rishi. I think most of the points have already been covered very well in this interesting session. I shall just try and see if I can uh, cover some additional points. We know that currently DMEC is the preferred technique of endothelial keratoplasty and it results in faster visual recovery and a reduced risk of endothelial rejection. This is a nice paper published in Clinical Ophthalmology 2019 where they did a survey among people who had completed uh, the course uh, with Dr. Melis and they found that uh, quite a few of them did not start DMEC because they were afraid of either inserting the tissue the wrong way or the anxiety related to tissue preparation. We know that if you fail to prepare your tissue, results in a loss of the tissue, and you have an additional cost of a second tissue. Uh, well, look at this case. This is a patient where we have been peeling. And as you are going ahead, you, I felt something was abnormal, did a tripan blue staining. And I can see that there was a horseshoe tear. So I started to peel from the opposite end to try and complete. Uh, seemed to work, but again, you can see in the periphery, there is some abnormal movement. We did manage to stain it and do the eight millimeter punch, but you will see that there are a peripheral tear extending to the center. After staining it, this is how the tissue was, loading it from the wider end. And it's always important here that when you load it, load with the uh, torn edge as the trailing part, not in the leading edge. Uh, coming to this insertion technique, I'll just highlight that uh, in a while. So you can see that we have inserted the donor scroll into the eye. It's important that you secure your wound and using two candlers, you can uh, you know, create this fluid waste by tapping in different parts of the cornea, either in the center or in the periphery, and you can get the scroll to open up. So you don't have to do very uh, vigorous tapping, They're just gentle tapping and releasing fluid from the side port as what Siddharthan was trying to show. You can get the folds to open up. The area where you have the tear may require a little bit more manipulation and you can stabilize the donor tissue with one cannula so that it doesn't move with the uh, external tapping that you're doing. But you can see that now this part is opened up. That's the large tear you can see. You can see the F stamp, it's in the right orientation. We do peripheral tapping to center the graph. And then once it is in the center, you go ahead, put a large air bubble, and that's the end of surgery. So that's the patient. You can see uh, the early post-op and late post-op, the clear cornea. So even if you have a torn donor, it doesn't affect uh, the outcome. This was a case where we literally had like an orange peel tear. And so we had to sacrifice about 40% of the graph. I had already stripped a nine millimeter area in the post. So, but we went ahead, we performed it like a hemidemic. So you can see that's the, the donor tissue, which is about maybe 60%. We had to look at the edges, the way they curl to ensure that the orientation is in the right way. And once it's fairly covering the pupillary area, we went ahead, placed the air bubble to complete the surgery. Now, this is how it was in the early post-op. The dotted area indicates where the graft was. And post-operative at one month, I was expecting some peripheral edema, but uh, I think there was good endothelial migration. So we ended up having a completely clear cornea. Rishi already uh, spoke about this illuminated uh, device. In terms of donor insertion, we use glass or plastic injectors. And we have seen you can load it from the front, load it from behind. One point I wanted to make to Ashish is that you can load from the tip, but remember that there is a shearing force at the edge of your uh, tip of the injector, which can sometimes take away endothelial cells because the endothelial cells are on the outer side of the scroll. So it's always better to load it from the wider side when it will be atraumatic. Now, when you are doing a DMEC, what I learned over the years is that when you put your inserter into the eye and you inject fluid, because these are all fluid-based injectors. What does the injection of BSS do? It basically increases the depth of the anterior chamber. And if your donor tissue has not yet gone into the eye, 
the formation of the anterior chamber also increases the intraocular pressure. As Siddhartha had shown that if you have a tight incision, you inject a little bit of fluid, the AC forms very well, and then you find it very difficult to get the donor tissue into the eye. And if you make the wound a little larger and then you inject the fluid, uh, <clears throat> you will find that as the fluid leaks out, sometimes the tissue also will have a tendency to try and escape from the same path the fluid is leaking out from. And when you are injecting the tissue faster, you know, especially with a uh, injector with narrower uh, tips, the fluid flow is very fast. And in that uh, at that point of time, when you inject the tissue in a deep anterior chamber, the orientation of the tissue is usually not maintained. And also, uh, when you're removing the tip of the cartridge, you have to be careful. We have to lower the pressure of the eye and then remove it. Otherwise, you can have a partial or total expulsion of the donor tissue. Now, this is a very nice uh, you know, diagram from Peter Wellman, and he has shown all the donor configurations possible. But the most preferable is the double scroll. Now, it's always, that's what we want to achieve. We want to achieve a double scroll all the time. So can we do that in a predictable manner? This is something that we published this year in April. So what we have done is we looked at the double scroll configuration. Is there a way to achieve it? So what we realized that when you load the tissue into the wider part of the injector, you can move the column of fluid back and forth. So when you push the tissue away into the wider part, it opens up the scroll. And as it tends to curl again, it can go into a double scroll configuration. So we did that for tissue, donor tissue between age group, 50 to 65, and we found that in about 85% of the donor tissue, we could help achieve this uh, double scroll. Very young donor tissues sometimes may go into a tight single scroll, which may not open up. And older tissues, which have a less tendency to curl, also may not go into a double scroll configuration. Now, to overcome this problem, what you have when you're injecting the donor tissue, what we say, what we try to do is use an AC maintainer, connect the AC maintainer with the flow on, then you insert the tip of your injector into the eye. So this gives you enough space to, tip, to introduce the injector into the eye. And then you can rotate the tip so that the open of the DM scroll is facing towards you and not towards the iris. After which you stop the flow in the anterior chamber maintainer. Then you ask your nurse to disconnect the AC maintainer from the IV tubing. So now the AC maintainer is acting like a conduit, allowing the fluid to flow out of the eye from the anterior chamber. And now when you inject the donor tissue into the eye, there is a unidirectional fluid flow as shown in this, what experiment we did by injecting tripe and blue during cataract surgery into the eye. And you can see that the same AC maintainer, which is disconnected from IV tubing, allows the tripe and blue to go out of the eye. So here you can see that as I'm inserting the donor, there is no counter pressure. The donor tissue insertion is very uh, smooth. And also when I'm removing my tip of the cartridge, because the pressure in the anterior chamber is low, there is no tendency for the tissue to rush out. And because the chamber is slightly shallow, the double scroll configuration is well-maintained. And then to unfold it, you really don't need to do too much manipulation. As all DMAC surgeons would agree that if you get into a double scroll configuration, uh, the unfolding does not take too much time. So in, all, in this series of uh, 20 eyes that we did, the average unfolding time was less than four minutes. And also the manipulation was minimal. So the endothelial cell loss at six months was noted to be only 16.7%. So if you have a shallow entry chamber and you have to do a DMAC, sometimes it's to your advantage because it allows easy unfolding. But if you have a reduced uh, working space, you can have difficult insertion, difficult unfolding. Peter, guys, you have, so this is a case of CHED where we do the same thing and Using the same technique, we insert the donor into the eye, close the wound. And as you see that because the orientation of the scroll is maintained, the unfolding is relatively atraumatic and you can quickly unfold without uh, too much of manipulation. The trifold technique, what uh, Rishi had shown, this is also quite useful. Uh, you need to fold the donor endo in this is loaded into a, this is a IOL cartridge. We pull the donor to the tip and then close it from behind using a foam tip plunger. This is the ICL foam tip plunger that I've used to close it. And then you can pull it into the eye 
This is the eye with the AC IO. It's endoing, so the endothelium is on the inside. It's protected, it doesn't touch the IO. And then you can place an air bubble within the scroll, manipulate it to open it up, and then complete the surgery. So that's the post op appearance. You can see that the patient did very well. Similarly, eyes which have a lot of significant upthrust uh, or eyes which are very small, you may have difficulty. This is again, you can see that the tissue was trying to rush out and as I used a little bit more force to push the tissue into the eye, the scroll configuration, you, you got a little fold there. And this is what happens when you try to inject tissue forcibly, you can get this triangular fold or the origami fold and to get this fold off, you have to deepen the anterior chamber and you have to tap at the area where you have the origami fold. The rest, of, so once you open it up, the rest of the unfolding was as usual. This is again a patient, one-eyed patient, multiple glaucoma surgery, tube done, 360 degree peripheral anterior sinicae. So when we took the patient off for surgery, not really sure exactly what we were doing. Didn't want to do a DSEC because there is not enough space, the recurrence of sinicae would be more. So we, using patients, we released the sinicae, then did the DM stripping. And when we tried to form the anterior chamber, it was really difficult. Uh, the air bubble was not remaining. So we decided to do a single port parsplenar core limited vitrectomy, provided the irrigation from the front, and just did a limited core vitrectomy. And now you see that after that, you're able to keep an air bubble in the anterior chamber uh, with relative ease. We did the tube trimming after this. We went in, trimmed the tube using micro scissors prepared a graft endo in seven millimeter in size. And you can see keeping the AC maintainer flow on, we pull the donor tissue into the eye endo in. And however, at this point of time, when we were trying to unfold it and we were tapping it, it was almost unfolded. We realized that again, the pressure had built up possibly from the, uh, you know, uh, aqueous misdirection that had uh, occurred while this process was going on. So putting an air bubble was again difficult. So we had to do a little, little bit of vitrectomy again, after which we were able to put the air bubble in comfortably. So that's the post of appearance early and at one month. And you can see on the uh, shine plug image as well that the anterior chamber is well formed. So you had a good visual recovery of six to eight. Post keratoplasty sizing is very important. Uh, sometimes you think that DMAC you can put in oversized but then inserting the donor itself can be oversized, it can be a little bit challenging. So here you can see that we have a graph that's slightly, because it's a large size therapeutic graph, so we try to match it with that size, and then you find that you have difficulty. So you can just nudge it in and secure your wound and then complete the surgery. If you have a very deep anterior chamber soft eye, you can place a small air bubble within the scroll and then you can use that small air bubble as an instrument to assist you in the unfolding of the donor scroll. So this is uh, quite useful because uh, you cannot use the other principles in vitrectomized eyes with deep anterior chamber. You cannot, uh, you know, release fluid, shallow the chamber because the lens iris diaphragm does not move up. So then you have to have something in the front that can allow you to unfold the, uh, to unscroll the uh, DM scroll. So you can see that but it's important that once you have unscrolled it, you should not quickly remove that air bubble. This should be very gradual uh, in a graded manner because if you quickly remove it, you will have the peripheral edges scrolling back again. And then you can go back uh, below the donor scroll and place a large air bubble to complete the surgery. Again, putting an air bubble, always put a small air bubble first and then go in and large the bubble. If you try and put a single large bubble right in the beginning, Sometimes that bubble can displace your graph. Yeah, I think we are. You, you can take a few more minutes. We have time. Yeah. So this is again, similarly, this is a post trap vitrectomized eye, uh, similar unfolding. So these are all challenging cases where usually in the all presentations, you will see that they are uh, contraindicated. You should not take up in post trap vitrectomized eye. But in similarly, in those kind of cases, if you can get it in a double scroll configuration into the eye, then you know uh, the rest of the unfolding can be quite uh, easy to perform. 
And you should not be in a hurry to try and tap. You should always place your graft into the eye, secure your wounds, and then try to observe that when you are doing your tapping, what's happening to the graft. You should be able to do a calculated tapping. So here you can see that as we are tapping, we are also looking at the eye, we are releasing some fluid tapping. So you can see that this is again an unedited video showing you from the time of insertion that we haven't done any. So the problem in the learning curve is that you do too much. You put your graft in and then you are, you know, without observing what's happening to the graft, you are making so many maneuvers that uh, the graft is actually unable to, uh, you know, retain the original uh, unfolding that it had produced. Intraoperative bleeding, Ashish had shown this video. So this was a surgery that I was supervising abroad and the surgeon was performing it and the PI was also performed. And here, because of too much of time spent in trying to unfold that Desmet was also losing its stain. And then during that thin shallowing of chamber, deepening the chamber and manipulate, manipulating, it's possible that the tapping also occurred close to the PI where it was performed, resulting in dislodgement of the clot and re-bleed. By the time I could you know, take over and do that, there was significant bleeding. So we tried our best, we were able to, unable to manage this situation. So I think if you do have a bleeding, you should try and, uh, you know, see that uh, to control the bleeding, to try and put an air bubble in the anterior chamber because air is the best way to secure the bleed. So we, this patient, we went back uh, after two days and you can see that I'm not going into the same incision because the primary incision that was made, the wound construction was not right. It was leaking, which was leading to the shallow chamber. So wound construction is very important. So here also you can see that we got the donor into the eye, we secured the wound, then we opened up the graft. I was more worried about a re-bleed from the PI, thinking that even if it's just two days, so we tried to keep our manipulation to the minimum, and then we were able to successfully complete the surgery. That's the same patient in the post-operative. You can see the eye looks very quiet. The patient did very well with 2020 vision, cell count of 1,800 microcells. So basically, in conclusion, challenging cases do require a modified approach in DMEC. Anterior vitrectomy may be necessary to improve the working space, especially if you're working with eyes where there is very limited space in the anterior chamber because of peripheral sinicae or you know, uh, sh with short axial length. In some cases, pull-through technique may be useful wherein you cannot uh, flip the tissue if it is placed in the upside position. So it helps maintain the orientation of the decimus membrane. And uh, the other approach in complex cases is to do an ultra thin dissect, which is also uh, gives equally good results and relatively easy to perform for somebody who's already proficient in doing dissect. Thank you. Thank you for a patient hearing.